In this video, we are going to be going over chapter one, the ocean environment from the Cengage Introduction to Marine Biology textbook. Throughout this video series, I will be going into much deeper depth on all topics related to marine biology, but this intro video just gives you a sneak peek of kind of the background of marine biology and how it all got started. And you can stay tuned to future videos for more depth and information on each of those topics. So in each of my videos, I start out going over the key concepts, but I don't spend a lot of time talking about them. I will just scroll over them and then you can come back and pause as necessary to look at those if needed. So our oceans and marine organisms, the things that live in there are so critical and vital to us living here on this earth. Our ocean specifically covers 71% of the earth's surface and oceans actually massively affect our global weather patterns and atmospheric conditions. Um, our marine organisms, of course, everyone knows they provide food and so they also provide jobs for different people who fish those organisms, but it's lesser known that they also provide a lot of research and a lot of new medicines for us are coming out of the oceans and future videos will go over that a little bit more. Sometimes as we start this, uh, people get confused or they seem to mix up what an oceanographer and what a marine biologist does. So an oceanographer specifically is someone who really studies the physical phenomenon in the ocean, like waves, currents, tides, temperature, salinity. They'll study like the levels of different chemicals in the water, or they'll study the pH. They are mostly studying the non-living things and how they are interacting in the ocean. Whereas, in marine biology, which I identify as a marine biologist, I've heard it jokingly said about us that we care the most about the pretty little fishes. And to some extent that is true. We care a lot about the living organisms in the ocean and that's the main driver for our study. And together marine biologists work with oceanographers to work on marine um, conservation and saving our oceans. Uh, I've gotten to live on a number of research vessels in my life. And one common thing that I have noticed is that marine biologists tend to, to keep all of our pretty little fishes, um, as an analogy alive, we tend to lean on oceanographers to know about how the tides or currents are moving in an area, maybe what the pH of the water is, the acidity levels, the different um, elements that are in the water, we tend to rely on oceanographers for a lot of that data and information to help us drive marine conservation. But interesting, I don't see it very often going the other way. Oceanographers, because they're working mostly on physical factors, they don't tend to need to rely on marine biologists as much because the physical factors, uh, the tides, the currents, the waves, those tend to happen regardless of the movement and activities of our pretty little fishes. Not wholly, but it, it can happen largely without the marine biology input. So it's just an interesting relationship um, where marine biologists really need to rely on oceanographers, but it's not necessarily vice versa. So there were great scientists across the history of the earth studying the marine systems for millennia, but some of the ones that we tend to recognize the most were the Greeks and Romans and then the Arabian philosophers that really looked at these creatures. So here's a few uh, pictures, Aristotle and an early drawing from the Greeks and Romans. And then here is a great drawing from an Arabian philosopher um, early on. So there was a really cool um, philosopher, Pliny the Elder. He wrote 37 volumes of natural history and most of that had to do with land creatures, but he did actually put in some ocean creatures. And then Aristotle, he had something that he, where he described the ladder of life and kind of a hierarchical um, 
determination of species that he had and he did have ocean species that he described in there and he knew things as detailed as gills exist and they have a function for gas exchange which is really cool based on that time period uh, somebody that gets a lot of shout outs as he should is charles darwin who spent a long time on ocean research vessels crossing um, the world's oceans and he ended up describing in detail things like barnacles these are some early drawings from that and also things like atolls and he recognized early on and developed the idea that an atoll was basically a volcano that had kind of eroded away and sunk down and developed a barrier reef and that's pretty complex and yet he knew that Additionally, there was a transatlantic telegraph cable that went all the way from the United States to Europe. And that cable was used for, hope, they were hoping to use it for telegraphs, but it broke. And something that long and a cable that strong, when it broke, it went down to the bottom of the ocean and they were retrieving it. And they ended up dredging up and bringing up tons of animals that were later described. Another ship expedition that studied the ocean was the Challenger, and it en ended up crossing the world's oceans for three and a half years, just going back and forth. And they brought back 50 volumes of marine biology data and 4,700 new species were documented by this Challenger expedition, which is just mind blowing to think of that. And on that expedition, they came up with the significance of plankton, which we know is one of the fundamental pieces of not only our food chain, but we also know that it is one of the most important um, factors for creating different things that we need in the atmosphere. And we'll talk about that as we move on. But important people from that was Charles Wyville Thompson that described these little floating organisms. And then it was Victor Henson who ended up giving the them the name Plankton in 1887. So this is a video by BBC Earth, Why the Plankton Are the Most Vital Organisms on Earth, if you want to check it out later. So marine biology in the United States, uh, Alexander Agassiz, um, he worked to dredge um, in the ocean. He went out on boats and spoiler alert for the future, his father actually had built the first marine biology lab, but this was the son and the son wanted a hands-on boat experience. So he went out and dredged in the oceans up to three miles deep. And with that, he made some critical observations that he saw where shallow fish and, and that's why I colored it in these fun colors here, were brightly colored. But deeper fish tended to be really blue and green, but the deepest creatures were tended to be red and black. And he made the connection between the wavelength of light and the changing colors of fish that is still valid and widely accepted today. He also made some great observations where he saw that the uh, organisms on one side of Central America and the Pacific were pretty similar to the other side of Central America in the Caribbean. And he hypothesized that those two areas of land were once joined or that those two oceans were once um, joined. And that's still widely accepted today. So his father, who was most likely his inspiration, set up the first marine biology laboratory in 1873 in Massachusetts. His name was Louise Agassi. And he really believed, and I love this about him, on in hands-on learning and studying the ocean. He wanted his students to study the fish in their natural habitat and not necessarily pull them out of the ocean. Um, down the road from that first Marine Biology Lab Institute, they ended up building the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole, and they pulled one of their driving messages from Louise that students should study nature, not books. So there's other cool marine biology expeditions in the 20th um, century, like Fitzjof Nansen, who went to the Arctic, or Alistair Hardy, who went to the Antarctic. 
And the main things is they started to really push the idea that humans were impacting the oceans and the oceans really um, impacted humans. And we need to start understanding how delicate those ties and those relationships are. Today, marine biology is still studied by scuba divers and by snorkelers and now also in the air by drone photography. Um, they do use submersibles like these to go down deep in the ocean and do photography. And more and more people are sharing not, on the, not only on the internet, um, but in other spaces. But one of the main things that is coming from this data and research is the ties between the marine environment and our, our activities here on land. So when scientists study different organisms in the ocean, they use the scientific method in a lot of cases, but not all cases, as I'll talk about in a minute. So usually the, the starting point for the scientific method is somebody sees something, like makes an observation, and then they form a hypothesis. And your hypothesis is the best guess as to why this is happening, your best explanation as to why something is happening. So I wanna show you what that would look like on something like seagrass if you were to study that. If you were to study seagrass and you wanted to know why some seagrass was growing better in one area than another, then you could start to develop a hypothesis. And say your hypothesis in this case was that the growth of the seagrass was limited by the amount of nitrogen. We know that nitrogen really helps plants to grow. So we're gonna make the hypothesis that this plot maybe had better and more availability of nitrogen, and so it grew better than this one that did not have as much nitrogen. So we're gonna say if nitrogen is added to the water, then the seagrass will grow larger or faster or both. Okay, so different steps of the scientific method that we looked at there. Here's a GIF with a lot of seagrass and one with less. Um, we are going to make an observation that seagrass grows better in some areas and make a hypothesis and then we're going to set up an experiment. So an experimental variable is the one thing that you are going to alter and in this case that's going to be the nitrogen, where we're gonna add nitrogen to an area with seagrass. So that's called the experimental set, where it is the area being experimented with. Then separately, we're gonna have the control set, where we're not gonna alter anything, we're not gonna add extra nitrogen, we're just gonna see how things go grow naturally there and see how that takes off. So we've designed our experiment and then we're gonna to start to carry it out. And in this experimental plot, we're gonna add extra nitrogen containing fertilizer. So we're gonna start giving it a lot of fertilizer. And then in our control plot, we are just gonna add fertilizer, but not with extra nitrogen. It's not gonna have any kind of added nitrogen. So this area doesn't have extra nitrogen and the experimental plot does. So then we're going to move along and we're going to gather some data throughout our experiment. And scientists will often use these pieces, like PVC pipe is very commonly used out in the ocean for research, where we lay down the PVC pipe, that is called a quadrat, and we take several different plots, and you can see a measuring tape here, that are measured at incremental spaces, and we start to pull in these results to see how things are growing differently. And from that data, we draw conclusions. And so say the grass in one area is a lot bigger and that was the one that had extra nitrogen and the one that didn't have extra nitrogen, it's just, eh, it's not growing as well. Well, we can't definitively say that for sure that was because of the nitrogen. So scientists from there, even though we've drawn our conclusions on our experiment, we go further and test again and again and keep reporting out that, that data and those results so that other people can build on that and really look to that for more information. So that's generally how the scientific method goes. Um, and that works for a lot of experiments, but there's it doesn't help you in every situation. And so not all science is based on the scientific method. Sometimes, and I'm gonna point to this really cool shark that is showing up in Southern California and has been coming in since about 2009. 
in Southern California, we've started to have this shark, which is called a seven gill shark. And that's really cool for a shark to have seven gills because most sharks only have five gills. And there's a, there's a really cool shark that has six, um, but to have seven gills is really, really special. It's a really prehistoric shark that, you know, has seven gills left over when most sharks now only have five. Well, why has this shark been coming to Southern California when normally it's, it's seen like in Africa, like in South Africa? Why is it showing up here? Well, it's really hard to set up a scientific method where you are trying to compare two things and, and, and add some condition to one set of sharks and not another set of sharks and see if they end up in Southern California after you do this experiment. It's a lot easier to just step back and take observational research data and observe and see what the sharks are feeding on. Where are they breeding? What would be driving them to come to Southern California where they're most commonly seen in Africa. So that is called observational science where you're really taking observational data and there's a lot of writing and recording and just really trying to observe and see what conditions are surrounding this and making this happen. So that ends our first video on the ocean environment. You can go on to video two and check out more information um, from our marine biology textbook. And I hope you enjoy this video series.